Welcome to The Advocate. Your panelists are here to discuss thought-provoking issues in an atmosphere of laughter and seriousness. Here, we call a spade a spade, and today we're here to remind you that important conversations are among the necessary tools for a saner society. In what I term the déjà vu effect of the Nigerian society, I'll be talking about the avoidance of future disasters in our country. Ruth talks about the increasing drug problem in Nigeria with heavy focus on meth. The saint with no halo, Kulelawal, is talking about a power shift in 2023 and Tonya ends with a conversation on corporate dressing. The Deja Vu Effects of the Nigerian Society Nigerians are a people that are stressed and broken. There is a different narrative every single day, which foretells of a terrible future of doom, uncontrolled violence, and unparalleled impunity across board. That is, from the corridors of power to the streets of the ordinary or average Nigerian. Oftentimes, we reference this future of total neglect and chaos, more like dub chop dog scenario, and we wonder when will we get there. The good news is, we are already there. Growing up in Festac in the 80s and 90s, residents of Ajegunle or Jo Okokomaiko looked up to Festac. It was a symbol of what we now know as Banana Island for the residents of that part of Lagos. It rivaled Surulere, and of course, the only difference between Ikoi, uh, from Ikoi rather, are the businesses, foreign missions, and other strategic infrastructure put up in Ikoi. While we lived there with pride, residents of neighboring communities looked on with envy. Residing in Festac was the ambition of this neighboring residents. Many years later, the nouveau riche of these communities all moved to Festac. With the mentality of their previous communities, they unwittingly unsettled the calm, opulence, and beauty of Festac. Pollution everywhere. Gutter started becoming choked. Festac became noisier. Drivers would leave the statutory parking spaces and park on pavements, and there came periodic floods after a heavy rain. An uncommon event a few years ago, drinking spots sprang up in this one-time residential environment of choice. And the old residents, particularly the older children who have made some money, started staying out of Festac longer to avoid the unbearable feeling of staying in Festac and eventually moved out of Festac. Now, Festac is a shadow of itself. If you were to visit Festac for the first time, you would not understand the glory that once existed. It feels like it has gone with the wind. Why do I call this unpleasant condition good news? We are already experiencing all what we assume is to come, unknowingly, and we are getting by. To prevent that unstable future of erratic violence, killings, and oppression, all we need to do is to think about now study our current situation and start working towards changing the narrative an event at a time so the question is what is happening now the original residents of festac refused to defend the integrity of their community when new residents started coming in these are residents who didn't experience the glory days of regular waste pickup flowing water and mutual respect among residents we allow those who don't know the history and the tradition of this community to take over. We then turn around and complain that things are not the same anymore. Well, you know that song. Standard of education has plummeted. Local government officials have become less responsive. 
because the residents that insist on their rights have all left the community. Street lights have become a relic of system that worked and the area is less safe because now you have more out of school children and dropouts who have been fortunate enough to discover the game betting structure. Festac is no longer as glamorous, as honorable, and we are all moving to the glorified villages called Ibejileki Anaja. Soon, all those people we left behind in Festac will make more money and see the lights in Leki, and they will also relocate to these glorious villages. At that time, where do we move to? Then the cycle repeats itself. Standard of education would plummet. Local government becomes less responsive. Street lights will stop working and the area will become totally unsafe. To prevent this impending invasion of Leki Aja Axis, all we needed to do was to support the new entrants in Festac to prevent that disaster of a future which has been foretold. We need to stop existing in our community and start living in it. We need to be intentional with our contribution to the development of our community. Support a school, support a child, look out for your neighbor, let the fence in your house stand for protection only and not a symbol of pride or separation by class. You don't need to care about Nigeria, care about yourself enough to ensure that you are safe and comfortable. And you cannot be safe and comfortable if your neighbor isn't safe and comfortable. Long live the Federal Republic of Nigeria. That felt more like a, you know, like a, in an Independence Day speech. Exactly. <laughs> you know, for me, I, the way I would choose to look at your advocacy mm. is that Nigerians have always assumed that class or or the proper way of doing things is yeah. in a location. It's not in a location. And that's why we always have these issues. You have mm. the same situation happening in um, places like in Abuja, yeah. where you say, okay, we move to this. Local Goma used to be quiet and it's a settled place. Mm. It's now become a jam-packed hype yeah, of activities. Yeah. Games Village used to be quite the place. It's becoming something else. And that is because we do not have any orientation exactly on how places should be run. Mm. We have no system. And if you've ever question anything in Nigeria, you'd understand our biggest problem is maintenance. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. True. Yeah. Very true. And it cuts across board. Yeah. Every area, maintenance is a big issue. Yeah. Very true. Um, and I also think probably in addition to that would probably be the value system that we actually mm. have within our society where, um, like you mentioned, everyone is thinking of himself and himself only in case where he's not even thinking that the actions of my neighbor is going to yeah. affect me. Yeah. It's going to affect my children. It's going to affect my grandchildren. I mean, that fact that there's no emphasis on the fact that we are in a community. You cannot live outside your community. You mm. have to ensure that you protect your community in order for your children. Because, I mean, one day we'll live here, we'll die. Yeah. Our children, our grandchildren have to benefit from whatever money or wealth that we have accumulated, accumulated over yeah. the years. And That's they can true. only get it if they live in a safe community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of two things that I really pulled out from there. All right. And the first being, you know, you, you, you build yourself this gilded cage, this gilded prison, high walls. Yeah. You step outside, oh, you see it's poverty. It's poverty, yes. yeah. Like, I, I have never been able to understand that. You think it's going to protect you. If mm. everything goes down, they're going to be, you're the one, they're going to chop fists. It doesn't take so long it, to pull it, down the fence. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying there is so on it in terms of engage with the community. Yeah. Know the different people. Yes, there are people who are neighbors like you who are middle class or mm -hmm. whatever, but there's other people who are in that community. Do you know any of them? That's it. Do you engage any of them? Mm -hmm. Do you guys, you know, interact? Because a community is more than just what's inside your compound. True, true. The second thing I would say is that it's bigger than what you said. Hmm. Look at climate change, right? Yeah. What you said is like the micro, micro story of the oh. bigger story. Hmm. If we look at climate change, if we're looking at what is going to happen in the future, right? We're planning for these communities. Yeah. But if you say, okay, let's not make Festac Town the subject matter, but let's look at climate change. Climate change, right? Yeah. It's the same story, but on a bigger scale. 
you haven't the government local government i don't blame federal government this is local government local. Sure. doesn't engage with the community at a local level mm. to to educate because it really is about value systems as ruth mm. said and education in those days uh, this is not the first time we're doing hand washing program right <laughs> yeah. in those days that was standard mm. about basic cleanliness about keeping your environment True. clean you know do yeah. not litter you know keep lagos clean and they would have Hi. these programs about yes. dental about brushing mm. teeth yes. about washing hands these were instituted these were everyday this was part of the of government life those are the and days government and the people were you exactly know, working and this is something obviously Kunle, this is your your side that is so important to work at the local government level because all these points that you make is really served from there mm. and it's not and we can't just look at it as oh just reaching out to the grassroots no local government also has to reach out to the middle class mm. and class. and above yes because they're also part of that community, community. and have yeah. a responsibility sure. because sure. everybody yeah. is is um contributing whether it's good or bad yeah and yeah. so you need to gauge all the community. Mm. You know, there's this lie, you know, especially since we're talking about the government, everybody say politics is local, which means you, you should go to the grassroots, go mm -hmm. to the grassroots. Mm -hmm. so that's like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Um, politics is local just simply means mm -hmm. your constituents should be able to have access to you, mm -hmm. whether high, rich or low. So, um, yeah, we all know I just moved to Lagos and then I passed by one police barracks and there were okay, posters yeah. of the local mm -hmm. government, there were people running for local government chairman on it. And that barracks, I think, is the worst thing I've seen in it's the world. It's terrible. I've been to places, but I almost had a heart attack looking mm. at that barracks. And, 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 and you see, like, like what you're saying, which is part of, it dovetails into what we had, what, with the presentation I made is, I met somebody who stays in one of these um, estates in Lekki. And you know, I was telling him about a project we have for communities. I want to raise funds for police and stuff. He looked at me and laughed, and he said, in their community, they actually take care of the police in that area. And as a result, the police is very, very committed to securing the area. And that is what we're not doing. Mm -hmm. We rather complain about everything. Mm -hmm. We are not helping teachers. We are not helping police. We are not helping doctors. Mm -hmm. All we do is complain. And these people too are like us, they complain. So from whence come up my help? Mm -hmm. But well, up next is Ruth. Stay tuned. The looming meth crisis in Nigeria. Sometime in the past week, some videos surfaced online of men that were being beaten with heavy woods. The men looked very thin, malnourished, and almost mad. These videos were taken in the southeastern part of Nigeria. These men were under the influence of meth. It's safe to say that they are meth addicts. Crystal meth, also known as Mpuru Miri by the southeasterners, and formerly, call, formerly called Methamphetamine is a synthetic narcotic with origin from Japan. According to drug literature, meth is a powerful, highly addictive stimulant that affects the central nervous system of an individual. Addicts can take the drug by smoking, swallowing, snorting, or injecting the powder that has been dissolved in water or alcohol. The high from the drug starts and fades quickly. People often take repeated doses in a binge and crash pattern. The drug stimulates the aspects of the brain that creates dopamine, first the addiction. Despite, knowing, despite the known dangers of this meth, drug dealers have not stopped in its dealing. In fact, its popularity is really growing in so many eastern states and communities. Reports have shown this drug is gaining popularity among youths and thus destroying their lives. In a conversation with re some relatives of some of these addicts, I got to understand how the lives of some previously well-off individuals went downhill because of meth. They sold their lands, properties, goods, etc., just to feed their meth addiction, which, by the way, is expensive. Families are being destroyed by meth, and we might have a social crisis in the near future. Suffice to say, 
that this meth addiction might feed more crimes in the future as addicts lose all sense of reasoning in a bid to satisfy their addiction. Again, we call on the NDLEA, all governments, that is local, state, and federal, to do something about this time bomb we are sitting on before it destroys an entire generation. They should not think this is only a southeastern crisis because the drug is already seeping into other regions of the country. You see, for me, it's whenever I hear of drugs, I shrink and I blame an entire generation. The reason is this. Uh, whatever we're saying about drug now, it's even more painful when we say, oh, in the future, in the future, it will be this, in the future. No. I remember about 10 or 15 years ago when we started hearing news about um, primary school students getting into cultism, taking drugs. The question is, what did we do? Someone that has been taking drugs from primary school, it would take a lot more effort to win that person of drugs than someone that has just been introduced to it as maybe as a young adult. As a primary school student or pupil, you, you, you're more reckless, you're exposed, you just take it as you're giving and it's become a part of your system for 10, 15 years. What have we done as a people? The government, the parents, the big brothers in the area, what have we done? Now you realize a lot of young people, for me, I, it's, it's, as good, it's good enough as saying that almost all of them take it. The reason is this, not because I have a particular uh, statistics that I'm working with, but the reason is this. Unlike before, when we were younger, we, when you see someone taking drugs, the person hides mm -hmm. to take it. If the person doesn't hide to take it, it's taking it where you are. You look at him and tell him, be careful, this thing will kill you. You are not condoning it because you're not taking it. Now, people take it more openly, and even their friends who are not taking it don't really see anything wrong in it. They will only tell you, this country is stressed too much, make we die. So which means that it's only a matter of time before you start taking it. So it's, I don't know if to call it a time bomb or a, like it, I said, it, it someone, really is a, time a bomb. keg of gunpowder. I said, no, this is a tank of gunpowder mm -hmm. and I, I don't know how. Yeah, um, I had no idea this was happening in this Nigeria meth. <laughs> like I'm so shocked, shocked because, eh? you know, you read and hear all these stories from, for example, the United States yeah. where meth has, for the past 20, 30 years, has really caused them a lot of, of trouble. And, you know, you think back here to uh, a couple of years ago when there was the issue with the cough syrup, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. travel like and codeine. Yes. With the co there was, codeine. there still is. Of course, there still is. Mm. But we were <laughs> introduced to it in the wider population yeah. that Face. it was going on. Now, this is scary on a different level because anybody can create meth. Yes. Mm. And that's the difference to the mm. other drugs. Mm -hmm. Anybody. It, you don't have to be smart. You don't have to have gone to school. Anybody can create meth oh, in their kitchen. That easy. Simple that YouTube easy. video. You know, you know, if you look back into the 80s, I remember, and I, I think I'll try and draw a social parameter for this. So in the 80s, if, or early 90s when I was in secondary school, if you were wearing a uniform and you were moving around, yeah. you <laughs> wouldn't even attempt it. Mm -hmm. Someone you don't know would be like, mm -hmm. What yeah. are you doing outside? Yeah. Go, back. Go back. They will take you back to your school yeah. Yeah. and you'll be flogged. Yeah. But now it's kind of common. You know, right? rights. Anybody Human can rights. do anything. Yeah. I think in the freedom of rights that we've given ourselves as Nigerians, we have begun to trample on the rights that will preserve this a culture. Mm -hmm. exactly. That's it. We, we have totally undermined ourselves. We have gotten to a position where it's not anyone's business. And I will tell you, most people will draft this away, but... My experience traveling Nigeria would always say this, and I'll say this. I think politics has fed the most rubbish into our system. And this comes down to the cults that are being used for political attacks. Mm -hmm. This comes down to training the next range of hard guys mm -hmm. that will push an agenda. And these guys get to do things which are not regular which cannot be done normally. A normal human being mm -hmm. would probably say no, but they need the money and then to dull their conscience, they mm -hmm. need a substance. Mm -hmm. And that's where we find ourselves right now. So even our politics is to blame for the kind of situation we mm -hmm. have right now, especially with the drugs. Everything is to blame, but, but the question is always, how do we get rid of this? Because NDLEA, I mean, they came out with a statement earlier on that the amount of drug in circulation 
is enough to sustain the level of crime and violence we have in a society, which means unless we reduce access to drugs, exactly. violence, banditry, kidnapping, all that will... Exactly. Yesterday I saw five guys were shown in, in, the, in the news. They were arrested around Aja with pump action. I mean, these are, you know, these red mm -hmm. bullets mm -hmm. that are very thick. That's the kind of gun they were using. The oldest was 24. We had a 24-year-old, a 20-year-old, a 19-year-old, a 16, a 17. Before a 16 and a 17, and even a 20, we'll be able to wield a gun and go on the streets. Well, I think that... What's their state of mind? If so crime is going to be even more of a huge factor. Mm. And unfortunately, I don't think it's going to get better. I think it's going to get worse because these are young people with no hope. So what do we do? We have to go back to the drawing board. It's, it's, it ties into... Everything we talk about in this show, we have to go back to the basics. Education, healthcare, power. Those are the three things mm. that need to be dealt with. Once you address those areas, it's a knock-on effect on everything. Mm. Because those three areas encompass all the values of a nation. And right now, the state of things, we have no value. Which is why life mm. is worthless and means nothing. That's it. I think just to add, um, I think I'll still go back to the same value system conversation, mm -hmm. but this time around within the families, because some of these people have families. Some of these people are, well, I mean, mm -hmm. they probably have people that could guide them through the path, way of life or whatever it is. But for some reason, these days, if you even, I mean, I was having a conversation with a friend one time ago, and this was on the Yahoo crisis then, and she was telling me that you see parents going in and registering their children for such things. Mm. So parents mm. typically these days are turning a blind eye to everything their teenagers, their children are doing, or sometimes are even enabling these things to because happen. Because they need to eat. Is it because, because they, need, they to need to eat? eat. Because yes. if, if really it's because you need to eat, there are so many other options. For example, are there? famine is one of the easiest that parents back in the day will have thought it of. It takes too long. There are so many Someone other things. to eat today. No, Toya, back in the day, Toya the parents will have no. sent the person to the Toya streets a very to strong point. do something. Toya has a very strong point. Mm. We, we are no longer a system that supports meritocracy, mm -hmm. which has built an impatience that's for, it. That's for finance. So it's impatience. It's not about just eating now. It's but about... It's in, we it's want a, I, I still wouldn't call it impatience. It's mm. impatience of one but I still wouldn't call it impatience. It's necessity. It's need. Need. And some people will compromise everything for that need mm. because they have no other choice. Yeah. You know? Well, well, I mean, I don't know if you say you don't have a choice, but it, like tying it back to the education thing that you spoke about, I mean, home training. I remember in a church, someone was asked to do something. I got angry. I was working out. And the, it's, you know, all these church units. And the leader of church unit came and said, no, don't do that, blah, blah. I was getting angry. Then another person came. And I was telling her, you remember how you trained us in this church years ago? And the person said to her, he said, listen, let this child go. After the child left, the person said, you, we trained you right from where you were younger. So we gave you all the values, all the trainings. This guy is coming to this church, a teenager. What is done to you, we will even do worse to the mother. So you now wanted to apply the training I gave to you 20 years ago on this guy that's ready, you know, mm -hmm. is like a crayfish already bent. You don't get Can anything work. out of yeah. it. So Can it goes, goes back to the home. When the mo mother misses it, every yeah. person misses it. Well, mm -hmm. well. <laughs> enough talking for now. <laughs> exactly. So up next is Kunle. Stay tuned. The Game of Thrones. This, of course, isn't about the TV show that got us on the edge of our seats by HBO. This, actually, is about the shift of power in the most populous black nation in 2023. Before I proceed, an overview of the state of politics as is. First, political parties. I know most Nigerians are not aware, but there are 18 functional parties in the country, according to INEC, as of now. The ruling party, of course, has stuttered in World Congress and has no elected exco. Other parties are yet to clearly define opposition and make the right moves, proposing the right solutions while galvanizing the electorate's support. 
they play the same game and expect a different outcome. You can't always preach. We are going to, if you vote us in, we will change it. We've heard that music a lot, a lot in Africa, and it's changed nothing. Secondly, the electorate. They scream good governance, which couldn't be louder or more agitated from a distance, from understanding the true power that has never been so far away from them. A little example. The wokest state in Nigeria is always Lagos. But when you weigh that wokeness against the LG elections in the mega city of wokeness, with less than 5% voting population participation, well, you have how ready we are for politics. Third, civil societies. Of course, with their grants, they look good. It's great to see the work in the space. And there are things we really need to point out to the inexperienced policy offering solutions for the politically illiterate. Now CSOs have said the PVC drive, the PVC drive. Nigeria has never actually had a PVC problem. 84 million registered voters in 2019, and yet only 28 million participated in the federal elections. CSOs have also tried to use the problem to create a valid future. What do I mean by this? Inviting the problem in the legislature to teach the future how to handle politics. The media houses. You'd love to think of them as the fourth estate. But in actuality, they are the third legs of politicians for brown envelopes and paid time on their airwaves. The crucifixion of investigative journalism and the outright abandonment of newsworthy material makes them puppies under the dinner table of the average dinosaur politician. They ensure the miseducation of the electorate, which is the worst thing they could ever do to a weakened democratic system. Now, for us to understand this, we must understand this critical statement. The game in politics is always to unfold and is never to be told, which means indirectly, you do not have access to what exactly is going to happen except you understand the way the chess pieces move. In 2023, there will be a generational shift. A lot of people will love to hear this, but it's not the generation you're thinking it will be. The generation that will take over power have served as ministers and governors and want a seat at the table. But I will tell you there's little good news somewhere down the line. As long as any generation is not strategic and unified, it will be lost in the ballot. Another good news for 2023 is that a lot of political dynasties will fall. And this will be because of the loss of power that occurs in any changing government. There will be a lot of intra-party tussles. And most of all, a weakened political structure by the two usual suspect political parties. But most of all, poor dominance by any political heavyweight in nation spread. The electorate at this rate will be at its most gullible ever in 2023, leading to bad political structures to the throne, which once again will bring in a government that does not know the constitution while in governance and be pregnant with corruption. Let's also add at this point that political literacy will be the, at the highest level possible. If you thought this different, let me ask a question. Deep in your heart, do you know your local government chairman? And in case you do, do you know he has no immunity? The way forward. One, we must come up with a unified front. For once, we must build a new tribe. And that tribe, we must be nepotic to. And the name of that tribe is being Nigerian. It must, supervi or it must supersede any religion, ethnic bias, or thought process which limits our front. This is the only way we can pick someone, not from the usual he has structure, which means he drives his G class and has 16 PAs, but a Nigerian who actually wants to represent the people. Secondly, we must have a clear understanding 
that we cannot survive as a nation with eight more years of bad governance. If there is a repeat of what we have faced presently over the last time within democracy or the last 21 years of democracy, there will be no country called Nigeria. The mismanagement of corruption, funds and people will be destructive. Third, political literacy and participation is most necessary to change governance. Now, by participation, you think I'm going to ask you to vote? No, I won't ask you to vote. And I'll give you an example. It's better we have an influx into political parties that ensures that we can, of course, change the kind of people that are in primaries and all political parties produce good candidates. Then we can leave it for 2 million people to vote at the, at the general elections. The time to start this? I will tell you is yesterday. If Nigeria fails, the entire black race fails. Okay, well, I, <laughs> if Nigeria fails, the entire black, feel, uh, entire black race will fail. I wonder why I'm stuttering. Maybe I need some chicken. But, um, <laughs> 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 but it's, I, okay, let me take it from that so before I even go to the Nigerian bit. So that's simply to say, Africa is where the black race is where it is today because of the current state of Nigeria, because we are not doing as well. Yeah. So if we feel further, that's what we are saying, that the entire black race will feel. But now, bringing it back home, I believe that you've expressed a lot of my fears, my concerns, and my views in your narration. Um, I believe that the our approach to governance and politics over the years has been wrong. We've not, we the people, we have not had our own voice and ideologies. There is no we the people. Okay, the individuals who make up citizens of Nigeria. All right. We've not had our own voice, and by that I mean that we trumpet what a politician has said. It's not anything that will favor us as a people. That, okay, we know that this is what will favor me as a person. So what you're saying now, if you were to tell them and say, okay, it's about joining a political party, a lot of people would disagree that don't just go around uh, saying you want, to, you want to vote alone, infiltrate the political parties, have a say, influence who, who the nominees are. And that has always been my view because we're not doing enough. Nigerians are at a point, that's why in my earlier um, my presentation I said we're broken. We don't see the light anymore. We've come to a state where we're stagnated. All we like to do is complain. So 2023, like you're saying, you've outlined all the do's and don'ts. How many of us even believe in those do's and don'ts? How many of us even understand it? So for us to even be able to achieve these do's and don'ts, I think it comes back to what you're doing, and we need to make it larger and what a lot, a lot more people are doing as well, which is educating the average Nigerian on what it takes to get into politics in Nigeria, what your rights are, saying uh, you have the right to vote out the local government chairman, what um, you really want or you deserve as a people, we don't know anymore. Because now everybody's talking about 2023 and all we are saying is anything but worry. And I ask, I say, okay, hold up. You can see that I'm not related to him. We're all suffering the same stuff. But we said anything but Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Now we're saying anything but worry. What are we going at? Who are we as a people? And we're accusing the politicians. Are we analyzing what we're doing? You talk about doing things differently. If you keep doing the same thing the same way, we say it's a madman that does the same thing the same way and expect a change. Anything but worry. Anything but Jonathan, now anything but Buari, whoever comes in, anything but that after four years? I don't know. So listen, if most people, right, are, mm. again, thinking about their daily needs, how much time do they have to really dissect the meat of governance, mm. of what it means? So they just know what they don't want. But what the average person doesn't think about is that it can't just be what you don't want, right? You have needs that are not being met, which is why you're struggling, which is why you have no time to address or look at these things. We need people who are running in government to understand our needs. But we also need ourselves to understand our needs. That's it. And therefore, what we need to do to make sure our needs are met. And I think that is what Kunle is getting at, is that you know, and, and um, what you're getting at is that there's a lot of talk, right? Yeah. 
we we say we want this, but at the end of the day, it's anything but anything mm, yeah. this. And then we'll go on and complain mm. again. Mm. But really, it would be helpful, like, the work you do is amazing, mm. right? So if more people, or it could be rolled out on a, wise, a wider basis, so that it's not just the average um, citizen that doesn't mm. understand governance. It's beyond the average. Yeah, it's I mean, actually yeah. most of the population. And so if we kind of address this, we have to really go back to the basics again in everything. And really, it's like baby, it's like weenie, mm. right? Mm. We have to take people back to the milk. Yeah. And that takes Understand a lot of work. Understand that it takes a lot of work and it takes commitment. Mm. And there are young pe people like Kune who are committed to this. So we need to find a way to engage and empower and for those in power to understand that this actually benefits them for this to happen. I think there's a lot of fear for them aside of losing power, fear of change because you feel that people come after you when you leave or that um, you will have that loss of power because power mm. is everything. Um, but I think they also fail to understand that these things happening can actually benefit both those in power and also the citizens, you know, well, in average power. life. Yeah. Um, mm. I think I, I would come from the angle of um, voting within parties, because I mean, I'm on the school of thought that democracy is not for an uneducated society. Like mm, preach, girl. So <laughs> <laughs> preach. So um, because I mean, we are we end up selecting mm -hmm. the majority. What the yeah. majority goes for, mm -hmm. and if the majority doesn't really understand what is happening or what governance is like, then we end up selecting what kind of leaders we've had in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, but now that you, um, um, he made mention, Kune made mention of um, going into um, the primaries, being involved in the politics, yeah. and then making that decision to mm -hmm. influence the kind of people that are selected in primaries, I think it's now making more sense to me. And I'm thinking, okay, this is an opportunity for smart minds mm -hmm. to actually go into politics because sometimes yeah. i mean I, ha I have conversations with um, some people um smart nigerians doing great stuff and ask them okay so how about going into politics and their re typical response is mm -hmm. like they don't want to dirty themselves hmm. um they don't want to be involved in all of those things mm -hmm. because for them politics for them is i have to take on a position but if they get to just understand that as a card carrying a member of a political party, I can decide, I can influence the kind of people that would be put forward yeah. in the president for the presidential election or gubernatorial election or even our states, that in itself would, would sort of be like a mind shift and yeah. sort of influence or make them want to decide to go into mm -hmm. um, you, you, um you know politics. talking about people and the influence of people, one thing that scares me a lot is in Nigeria today, unfortunately everything has to be binary. You must either hate worry mm -hmm. or love him. We don't discuss issues where we say, okay, this thing worry did is good, this thing it did it bad. Once you start saying good or bad, I say oh, you're unstable. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, guys, um, I must say, if we continue this conversation, mm -hmm. that it will take a very long time. Yeah. Nigeria has always run a selection and not an election because mm -hmm. we rarely participate in the process. So, rounding up here today is Tonya. Do stay tuned. Corporate attire in Nigeria. Today, no long speech. I'm getting straight to the point, swift and sharp to leave more time for discussion. My topic is on corporate attire. I confess, I've never had a real strict corporate job where I've had to dress in suit and all that. Corporate wear in the world of banking, finance and general business for men is a suit and tie and the equivalent version of skirt or trouser suit for women. I have always kind of wondered why this is. We live in a hot and often humid climate, and so it has never made sense to me that we wear the same corporate wear the Brits do for their climate. Wouldn't it make more sense for our usual corporate attire be more appropriate for our environment? Why the uncomfortable sweat-causing attire in our hot weather? Well, it goes back again to the colonial masters 
who impressed on the Nigerian people that our way of life and culture was inferior, and this has stuck. If you want to be taken seriously in the corporate world, you must wear a suit and tie. Does that mean that those who prefer native are less serious? The one thing I love about our government is the proud way our politicians wear their native attire, something that the corporate world has failed to do. It astounds me also that in the 21st century, our lawyers and judges are wearing 18th century wigs and gowns. It's, frankly, it's utterly ridiculous and a reminder of just how deep the colonial mindset goes. Didn't we take our elders and workers seriously prior to being colonized? Let's look at it this way. I believe we have the best looking men in the world right here in Nigeria. And a Nigerian man looks his best in native. I also love it when it's dress down Fridays and you see workers choosing to wear their native. It isn't dressed down because you know our Niger peoples know how to give them. And this allows for a certain personal expression in the workplace. So why do we continue to hold up this outdated suit and tie standard of corporate wear? Once again, I say to you, decolonize the mind and we can decolonize our bodies. It's one simple thing to me. I was going to add the wig and gown. Thank God you added mm -hmm. that. And another thing we should add is why a policeman wear black under this hot sun. You know, and you, yes. want them, you, you, would, you don't want them to be nice that is so when they're baking. <laughs> Why do we wear black in the hot sun? So many things are wrong. You and know? it goes back to how we think. We just do things because as it was in the mm -hmm. beginning, it is mm -hmm. now and forever shall be. Mm -hmm. What will that end? You know, for me, it's, it's, it's highly, I don't know whether I would say crazy. <laughs> because for people that steal our culture mm -hmm. and tell you that your culture is not good, you abandon your culture, mm -hmm. yet your artifacts are in their museums. Mm -hmm. Your music is being translated into their mm -hmm. music. Your entire lifestyle, your food. Your, mm -hmm. Let me even tell you how bad it is. In medicine, everything we know as an advancement in science was taken from Africa. Even education was taken from us. So mm -hmm. we had the first university somewhere around... Um, in Timbuktu. Yeah, yeah, in Timbuktu. Yeah. Had the first university. These guys create a Harvard and tell us Harvard is better, really. So it, it, for me, it's, it, it will always be that way as long as you do not have a history, a trail that you can look back to. Because, you know, when you have, it's like when it comes to tell you now that, okay, take this herb. As an educated person, you want to find out what does it do to me. Mm -hmm. They can't explain to you, just take it. We need, it's time for us to start doing research and penning down all these activities. Because, for example, I tell people that. When we talk gender balance, it's in a way funny to me. The reason is this. Before the colonial masters mm -hmm. came, right, a chief, let me use the Yoruba area, for example, which I'm very familiar with, a chief cannot take, or a king cannot take a decision without the, um, what's this woman called, Yalode, mm -hmm. who is like the minister for women affairs. You remember all the Abba women riot, the Kanu women riot? Our women have always been powerful. But we, there, came, there comes colonization that tells us, okay, this is how to go about it. Then years back, we're now being told, no, let give your women rights, give your women rights. So I was like, we used to, we're told it's not, and now we're going back. And the same thing goes to, I remember I had a friend who, was studying, who studied psychology, and one day came back from school, university, and I was saying, in human psychology today, they learned that when you're pregnant and you're listening to jazz, opportunities are that your child will love jazz or music. Mm -hmm. And I got so angry and didn't understand why. I said, listen, when we were younger, we had our mothers telling us that, no, when you're pregnant, don't go out and fight. And our mm -hmm. uncles who have traveled abroad will tell you, no, all this uh, superstition, why would that affect the child? It's the same thing. We just need to do research and write down all these things. So the thing that really kind of is just so strange to me, when... <laughs> You know, you're going from one place to the other, especially in the morning, people are going to work. And you see people who are, you know, it's busy. Lagos <laughs> is hectic getting to work. And you can see them struggling yeah. with the, what they're wearing, with mm -hmm. the heat. So by the time they get to work, this, you know, they've sweated, Sweaty, smelly. With body odor, mm -mm. and all that. It's just not conducive. And that is someone who's a hard worker. That is someone who spends how many hours going to and from work? See the same person on that Friday where they're allowed to wear their trad. And it's very, very different. And I just feel like 
why is it you honestly if you put a picture side by side of the same person all right if Uluwakayade, our supermodel on the advocate if we put him in a suit mm. and we put him in a trad i'm sorry the trad will win every time actually i'm not sorry the trad will win every time <laughs> well you, you know, know, the second look at well, you know the funny thing on the advocates today we get to see our supermodel tonya oh, you. you know we're in trad and she knows she's she's so she's so um sydney crawford like you know, oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, ruth please go, so, go ahead so i i think um i mean from what's happening now in the startup yeah. world sort of changing the narrative um, and thanks to COVID as well, because mm -hmm. mm. um, I'm prior to my current job, I used to work in a more corporate environment where we had that we fought, rigid. <laughs> we fought for them to change the um, dress and dress culture because you couldn't wear certain, as a lady you couldn't wear certain kind of um, three quarter trousers. You couldn't wear this. You couldn't wear that. And you'd be asking yourself like, the dress doesn't change my impute. Mm. I'm still going to do the same work. With or without, there's always that perception that oh, I have to, you couldn't wear open toe shoes, you couldn't wear sandals, you couldn't wear. I mean, mm -hmm. things that do not influence your work in mm. and and also because there's that um, perception that you're trying to maintain. But now with COVID, everybody working from home, you don't even know what I'm wearing. One and then two in the startup world, there's now that um, is in fact it's cool. Mark Zuckerberg yeah, yeah. and appearance. Please don't, yes. don't mention Mark Zuckerberg. It's <laughs> <laughs> a whole other <laughs> conversation. You have to dress down, tackle, yeah. to wear whatever you want to wear mm. at any point in time. So it's it just sort of, I mean, I think it's changing. I actually think. Uh, what besides you if you go for an interview wearing traditional you'll be asked are you here for an interview yes mm -hmm. no. so it, 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 it feeds, it feeds into that perception of what professionalism is mm. um we could also talk about hairstyles relating to oh, that yeah. as well mm. but i really do believe that there's a place for our own attire in the corporate uh, workspace we have it everywhere else but it must enter the corporate workspace so thank you so much for your attention while the program lasted we hoped our conversations resonated with you. Little drops of water, they say, make a mighty ocean. Don't forget that advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook. Plus TV Africa. Hashtag the advocate NG and Instagram at plus TV Africa. Hashtag the advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plus TV forward slash the advocate NG. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Join us next week, same time, on this station. Let's keep advocating for a better society. See you next time.